Okay, um, so what I'm going to talk about today uh, is um, correcting for the case where uh, your implementation of your qubits or your quantum computer uh, is susceptible to loss errors, um, which we might expect to happen at a much higher rate um, than, than uh, what we call uh, computational errors, so that those are the kind of Pauli errors that, that keep you within the computational subspace. So um, this is uh, joint work with, uh, with Tom Stace, who's in the audience somewhere uh, from UQ, and um, we have a bunch of publications already, and also there's some related talks going on later, which I'll, uh, I'll mention at the end of my talk. Okay, so just to outline um, what I'll be talking about. Um, so, um, so, so these loss errors, or equivalently leakage errors, these are really a serious problem for practical implementations of quantum inf information processing. And I'll talk a bit about particular implementations on the next slide. So really, um, the fact that this is such a serious problem really motivates um, optimized schemes, so, so we can think about error correcting schemes that are really optimized to correct for loss errors. Uh, and also fault, to fault tolerance schemes. And in particular, what I'll talk about is that um, the, the surface codes, which we've heard a lot about this week, um, these are extremely robust to loss errors with a very high threshold. And it turns out that the threshold is related to um, the percolation threshold. Uh, and furthermore, um, fault tolerance schemes that are derived from these codes, in particular the scheme that Robert talked about uh, on Monday, and we also heard Austin talk about yesterday, um, these topological schemes, these are also uh, extremely robust. Um, we already knew that they were robust um, from the simulation results than previously. Uh, we already knew that they were very robust to computational errors. Um, but uh, what I hope to show today is that they're also uh, extremely robust to loss errors. And in particular, just to, I'm going to tell you ahead of time, um, what we find is that we can tolerate up to 25% loss, loss errors in this model. OK. So um, in many uh, implementations, loss errors are really the dominant source of noise. So in particular, if you think about quantum computing with photons, um, photons tend to preserve their polarization for, for very long times. Um, but you have all these, all these mechanisms in any implementation that uses photons as the qubit carrying entity. There's all these different mechanisms uh, by which you can lose your photons. So in particular, you can think about mode mismatch, um, imperfect single photon sources, and inefficient detectors. All of those things effectively amount to um, losing your qubits. Uh, and similarly, in, in any kind of atomic implementation, so uh, trapped atoms in optical lattices or iron traps, you have this issue of imperfect loading, for instance, in, in optical lattices. And just uh, storing atoms or single ions is a really difficult thing to do. And we shouldn't be too surprised if those uh, single trapped atoms occasionally go missing. Um, and then finally, this is a slightly different uh, error model, um, but it can be uh, addressed with uh, similar techniques to what I'm going to talk, talk about today. And that's if you have some solid state schemes, such as superconducting qubits or quantum dots or something like that. Um, you should expect when you make a large array of qubits that, that, some, that there'll be some fabrication errors and so some subset of your qubits, some subset of your devices are probably not going to work. And so the kinds of techniques um, that I'll talk about today can also be uh, applied to that, although it, it's a slightly different error model. Okay, so just to review the, the toric code, which we've um, heard a lot about already. In the toric code, the qubits live on the edges of this, of this L by L lattice. Um, and one can uh, Im impose periodic boundary conditions. Uh, it's a stabilizer, which means um, that it's the, the, the valid code word states of the plus one eigenspace um, of all of these uh, stabilizer operators. And there's two different types, uh, two different types of generator for the stabilizer code. You, we have these star operators, which are just uh, tensor product of four Pauli X operators around a ridge, uh, a, a single um, node of this lattice. And we also have these plaquette operators, which are, are made of Pauli Z operators uh, around a face of this lattice. Okay, and it should be, should be pretty obvious that these two guys are gonna commute with each other. Slightly less obvious that when um, these guys kind of overlap, that they also commute. Um, but if you think about it, you, you'll see that um, always whenever you um, have a clash like this, the, uh, the, the stabilizers kind of clash at two sites. Uh, and so when you calculate the commutator, you'll get two minus signs um, from, from these uh, X and Z operators. So these overlapping stabilizers always 
share two, two qubits, and so they always uh, commute. Um, and so that tells us that the, this, these, uh, these operators form a valid generator for a stabilizer code. They're all mutually commuting observables. Okay. Uh, we also know that one of the stars uh, can be expressed as a product of all of the other, all of the others. So one of these operators on this lattice um, is not independent. So that tells us um, that the generator, the smallest set that can generate the whole stabilizer, um, takes this form. And in fact, there are two, two L squared minus one uh, independent generators um, and a little bit of arithmetic that tells us that at least for these boundary conditions, we have two encoded qubits. Okay, so now we have um, the, the, the stabilizer. Um, we should ask what the, uh, the encoded operators look like. Um, so uh, it's instructive to first consider the affine of operators on a, on a state uh, that's on, on one of the code word states. Okay, so if, if we have this chain of uh, Z operators here, then it's gonna anti-commute um, with the two star operators at the end. So this guy can't be a, a valid um, code word operator. But what this does tell us is, is, is that if we wanna find operators that do commute with a stabilizer, we have to f form closed loops. And it turns out that there's two different sorts. There's these things that are called um, homologically trivial loops. So these are things that form loops that can be, um, that can be tiled by the plaquettes. And then there are these non-trivial guys that wind all the way around the lattice, okay? And it's these guys um, that are, uh, they commute with the stabilizer, but they're not, they're not uh, generated uh, by the stabilizer. They're not part of the stabilizer. So these guys are the logical operators. And in fact, what's important is the, is the homology class of these operators, which is just jargon for the sense in which they round, they wind around um, uh, the torus. This system is living on a torus, and any, any operator, any logical operator, that winds around the torus in the same sense um, has the same effect on encoded states. And that's a really useful fact that I'm gonna make use of um, shortly for uh, explaining how to correct for loss errors. Um, and the really important thing is that there's a lot of redundancy in how we can um, define this Z operator. Any Z operator that goes from the, from, the, from the bottom to the top of this lattice and starts and ends at the same place in, this, in the case of the toric code uh, is a valid operator. And so there's a whole family of these guys that all encode the information or all measure the encoded information in the same way. So we have a lot of freedom there in, in, in how we uh, read out the state of this code. Okay, so this is just uh, a review of, um, of the work that was done in uh, Preskill's group uh, almost 10 years ago now um, to determine the, the, uh, the error correcting threshold of this code. And the correction procedure uh, is a stabilizer code, so it's just a conventional correction procedure where we just go through and measure all the generators of this code. These generators reveal the endpoints of the error chains. And for an error chain E, we need to find a correction chain E prime such that the, the sum of these two is trivial, so that it forms a trivial loop. So this guy is an element of the stabilizer, and so it's, uh, uh, the, the net effect of these two guys um, is to return um, the code to, a, to a, a valid state. And this is done with the minimum weight matching algorithm, which we've heard quite a lot about already this week. Um, and what, uh, uh, well, Wang, Harrington, and Preskill found uh, in a paper in 2002 is that the, the threshold for this code is uh, at 10.3%. So that's a numerical result, but it, um, it corresponds to a phase transition in a classical statistical mechanical problem. Um, uh, and yeah, this is the value that we get. Okay. So um, now I want to consider the effect of loss errors. So by loss errors, the important, the, the defining characteristic of loss errors that I'm going to make use of is that um, we know where they are. So if you have a loss or a leakage error, in principle there's a measurement that you can do that will tell you whether the qubit is there or not, which doesn't actually disturb the logical state of the qubit. So an, an equivalent error model you could think of uh, depolarizing noise, where you have an extra piece of information, which is that you know where the depo depolarizing no noise has occurred, okay? And if we have either of those error models, um, then, this, then that, that actually helps us enormously uh, in, in decoding this, this code, okay? So as I mentioned before, we can take this, one of these encoded logical operators here, and there's a whole family of different operators that encode the same information. In particular, what I can do is I can take the original encoded Z, modif modified by a plaquette, which has the effect of deforming it, um, by one square, and that will give me a, a new operator. Keep doing this, I can, I can take products with as, as many of the plaquettes as I like, 
and get a deformed path. So what I've tried to show here is we've lost a bunch of qubits, which is a bunch of deleted edges on the original lattice. Uh, and what I can do is I can find a path that goes all the way across the lattice, like this. Okay. Um, so, um, so I can uh, I can decode um, this code in the presence of these of these loss errors, uh, provided I can find such a path. And this is a very well studied problem um, uh, in probability theory. It's just percolation, uh, and uh, and the probability of being able to find this, at least in the limit of large lattices, is well understood. So this is going to correspond to um, the bond percolation threshold for the square lattice in two dimensions. And this is, this is a well-known result. The relevant number is a square lattice uh, bond percolation threshold, which is uh, 0.5. So what this tells us is that the threshold for loss errors for the toric code is 50%, which is much higher than um, uh, for, the, for the bit flip or the phase flip errors. OK, so that's, um, that's what we would do if there were no other errors. Um, but of course, that's not a particularly realistic assumption. We, we want to know if this code still works when we have loss errors um, and bit flip or phase flip errors at the same time. Okay? So when qubits are lost, um, it turns out that we can no longer measure these individual stars and plaquettes unambiguously. So if, we have, if this qubit here is lost, then it means that these two um, plaquettes can no longer be measured in an unambiguous way. So the solution to this is that we just take products of these guys. So rather than measuring these two original generators, we just measure their product. Um, and that is guaranteed also to be uh, a, a valid sta stabilizer operator for this code. Okay? So now uh, we have effectively a different lattice um, with, these, with these larger plaquettes, super plaquettes is what we call them. Um, and these guys can now be measured unambiguously. Okay. And then um, we just have a modified version of the minimum weight perfect matching problem. So the way we implement this is that we just take, we just construct this graph, which represents um, the original uh, stabilizer elements. And then we want to merge nodes on this graph. Uh, and this gives us a, um, a reduced graph. So every time we, we, we take a product of stabilizers, what we do is we, uh, so if we have lost the, uh, the qubit that, that was originally corresponding to um, the edge between nodes A and B, we remove that edge and we, and we merge the corresponding nodes into a single node, and this new node inherits um, all of the other, all of the other um, edges that the original A and B nodes had. And then we hand this reduced graph to the, uh, to the minimum weight perfect matching algorithm. And then we just um, do a whole bunch of Monte Carlo simulations of this, pro of this process, and we can ask what happens when there are simultaneously loss errors um, and uh, computational basis errors. Uh, and we get this picture, okay? So what's happening here is um, this axis here is the, uh, is the probability of a uh, computational error. So that's, think of, a, think of a bit flip error or a phase flip error. And this axis here is the, uh, is the probability of loss errors. And each of these red points here is actually um, uh, determined through um, numerical simulation. So these, each of these is a, essentially a, a different threshold for different values of the loss rate, okay? Uh, and what we find is if we, f if we fit, there's some, some kind of um, finite size effects down here that I don't want to get into just yet. Um, but uh, if we just take, say, these, uh, these points up here, and then this blue line is just a, a quadratic fit to those points. And what we find is that blue curve hits this axis exactly um, where the percolation argument predicts uh, at 50%. So this is kind of um, good evidence that uh, uh, the, the percolation argument is... is uh, is actually giving us a threshold for loss errors. Um, so we have this very large region here um, of this parameter space uh, where it turns out that we, that we, can, um, we can use the, the toric code to correct for both um, loss and computational errors. OK. okay so. Um, that's all very well and good. Uh, um, that tells us how the, the surface code um, uh, behaves. In, you know, how the, it tells us about the performance of the surface code when we have loss errors. Um, but uh, it's, there's, there's some fairly unreasonable assumptions there. So um, we, uh, that, that we could always measure 
these, uh, these parity check operators, these uh, stabilizers rather, the stars and plaquettes um, with, with uh, perfect fidelity. So um, we know that that's not good enough. If we're going to build a quantum computer, we have to assume that everything is noisy. We have to assume that um, our, as well as storage errors, we have to assume that all the gates that we use to encode the, 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 the error correcting code um, and, and the readout and so on, we have to assume that everything uh, has some noise, okay? So, um, uh, uh, Robert has al already described on, on Monday uh, how to do that with the surface code, um, and it's this topological fault tolerant quantum computation scheme. Um, and, so, and so there's a, a, a sequence of papers, I suppose, going back to around 2004, which introduced these ideas. Um, and it's inspired by uh, topological quantum computing, um, but in fact, everything uh, is, is described in terms of measurement-based or the, or the one-way uh, quantum computer. Uh, and this, um, this scheme has got a number of nice properties. Um, uh, so one is that it's uh, translationally inv invariant, and it only involves nearest neighbor gates. Um, and something I won't mention today, but, um, but Robert mentioned on Monday, that this all works in two dimensions. So although I'll everything I'll describe today will be in terms of three-dimensional cluster states, in fact, it's fairly straightforward to kind of squash everything down into two dimensions um, and, just, and just think of this, uh, this third dimension as a, as a kind of simulated time axis. Okay. And then the really nice thing about this is that the threshold uh, numerically has been shown to be at least 0.75. So this is a very high threshold, uh, and there are probably various uh, optimizations. Well, Austin has already talked about some of them, um, which, can, which can push this up uh, towards 1%. Okay, so just to, um, just to review this scheme again. Um, the measurement-based quantum computing scheme, so we actually start with one of these cluster states um, on a 3D lattice, okay? And this is a unit cell of that cluster state. So we have um, qubits at the at the, the center of every uh, edge of this cell and at the center of every face, okay? We've got two different types of qubits, the red ones and the blue ones. Okay, and then these black lines here represent just control Z gates that act between these qubits. So this is just a standard um, cluster state. So how we would prepare this is we prepare each uh, qubit initially um, in, the, in, in an X eigenstate, in the plus one eigenstate of the the Pauli X operator, and then we apply these control Z gates everywhere across this lattice. Okay, and then these qubits are divided into three different types, and they all have a different role to play in this scheme. So we have these um, these defect qubits, um, which are which are these guys in these uh, shaded regions. These are all measured in the Z basis. And then we have also have these uh, V qubits, the vacuum qubits, which is everything else, everything that's kind of colored in white here. These guys are all measured in the X basis. Um, and then finally, we have the, these small uh, S qubits, these red guys, which are kind of sprinkled about in amongst this lattice. And these are measured either in the Y basis or the, uh, the X plus Y basis. Um, and so what's the point in all of that? Well, these two guys here um, topologically implement uh, the Clifford group, or at least um, a large subset of the Clifford group, um, which isn't quite universal. And these remaining measurements um, are required to, um, to make everything universal. Um, and we do that uh, by a magic state purification. Okay, so um, just to, I'm not going to explain the whole scheme in, in much detail. It's already been covered in a couple of different talks this week. Um, but just in slightly more detail, I'll explain how you do nothing in this scheme. So how you do the, the, uh, the identity gate. Okay, so... Um, this is just like a region of that big cluster state um, that has two defect regions, so these two cylinders here. These are the regions that we're going to measure in the Z basis, okay? And then everything else is going to be measured uh, in the X basis, okay? So everything else is vacuum, so that means we, we just do single qubit measurements on those guys in the vacuum basis, okay? Um, and uh, uh, in this scheme, the, the logical qubits uh, are encoded in the surface code, so you can think of each kind of space-like plane of this lattice, each kind of slice um, in this direction uh, it, it has uh, log the logical qubits encoded in the surface code. Um, so, so what that means is that we take, um, we take a surface code with uh, stars and plaquettes everywhere, and then just on a couple of sites, or actually throughout these whole, re throughout these whole defect regions, um, we don't um, 
uh, uh, enforce the, uh, the stabilizer operators. And what that actually gives us is a pair of encoded uh, qubits um, with logical operators that either, either um, kind of orbit the hole or, or thread between two holes. So if you look at this input plane here, what you can see here um, is an encoded X operator, which is this guy, which just does a lap of that defect. And then we have the encoded Z operator, um, which is this guy, which just threads between the two. Okay. And what we want to show is that um, this sequence of measurements actually maps this, um, or teleports, in effect, this, um, this input plane uh, onto the output plane. Okay. And to, to understand how this works in a bit more detail, I think the most intuitive way to see this is to think of these um, stable operators that stabilize operators that uh, define the, um, the cluster state. Okay? So we have a bunch of uh, eigenvalue equations that define this state. Okay? And each of these Ki operators is just a single cluster state operator um, located on a face of this cubic lattice. So it has an x in the middle and it has z's all around the outside. Um, and products of this guy uh, has, ha have a really intuitive form. Okay? So products of these, uh, of these face operators just give us what, what are called um, correlation surfaces. So these correlation surfaces look like this. In the interior, uh, in the middle of each face, we just have x's. And then around the perimeter of the whole surface, we have uh, z's. And, and the z's in the middle here, these have all cancelled out because z squared just gives us back the identity. Okay. So it's these correlation surfaces that you can really use to understand uh, how this gate works. And in particular, if you just think about what the measurements, what the x measurements um, on, on those uh, uh, stabilizers, on those correlation surface operators give, um, then you can quite easily show um, that after you've done all of those x measurements on everything except the input plane and the output plane, that you project um, the remaining qubits, the input plane and the output plane qubits, into this uh, maximally entangled state. Um, okay, and then uh, it's straightforward to show um, just that just by measuring the input slice uh, in the x basis, we, m we map these input operators to these um, output encoded operators. Okay, so the input state has then been teleported after doing all that to, to the output plane. Okay. So now what happens um, if we include errors into this picture? Okay, so um, again, just consider um, these correlation services. So if we, if we think about these um, products of these Ki operators around individual cubes of this lattice, they also take on this nice form. Now, a closed surface like this has got no boundary. So now Zs, all of the Zs have cancelled out. So now we just have this um, uh, six-sided um, operator, this kind of parity check operator, this parity check cube. And this plays a very similar role as the plaquettes did uh, in the surface code in the two-dimensional version. Okay. So, so what this tells us is that cubes with product minus one reveal the locations of endpoints of error chains. So we have this picture where we go through and, and uh, infer the value of all of these cube operators only by doing single qubit operators. So we don't need to do um, a six-body uh, a, a six uh, measurement here. Uh, we can infer all of this just by doing single uh, qubit measurements. Um, and that will give us um, uh, uh, a syndrome that looks like this. So we'll have a bunch of cubes that have the wrong sign. And then again, we just um, uh, send this off to the minimum weight matching problem. And we just need to find, um, so this is an error chain which would give us um, two minus uh, cubes like this. And we just need to find corrections like this, such that these guys form trivial loops. Okay, And trivial loops uh, in, this, in this sense mean that the loops need, must, must not thread between these two guys. Well, yeah, they, they mustn't thread between these two, op these two um, defects, or the, and they mustn't wind around. So that's the condition for successful error correction. Okay. So how do we correct for loss errors um, in this, in this uh, scheme? So the first idea is analogous to how we, ha how we dealt with loss errors uh, in, the, in the Toric code. And you remember um, earlier in the talk, what I said was all you do is you just deform the, um, the logical operators by multiplying them by plaquettes. So in this scheme, what we do 
um, instead is we, is we actually want to deform the correlation surfaces, right? So we need to deform the correlation surfaces because if one of the, one of the, in the correlation surface is lost, then we can't measure the parity of the whole surface. So we, de so we deform the whole thing, and we do that just by um, uh, multiplying by these, uh, by these closed cubes, okay? So, so we can do that, and we can deform these surfaces so that, so that they avoid the lost qubits. So if we assume that there's a couple of qubits lost here, then we can just always find, um, well, not always, but uh, if it's a correctable error, then we can find cubes such that when we multiply this original surface by the cubes, we have a new surface that is um, topologically equivalent to the original surface, but now it avoids the lost qubits. Okay. And as long as we don't lose too many qubits, we're able to reroute all of these correlation surfaces, and the gate still works. We can still inf in infer the, 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 the parity that we need to, to do this teleportation. Okay. So it turns out that rerouting these correlation surfaces is actually dual to the problem of bond percolation. Um, on this 3D lattice, okay? So X failure threshold co coincides with the percolation threshold um, for bond percolation in three dimensions. So this is what we kind of believe before we've um, done any measurements, okay? So we believe that um, there's gonna be some region here when, when we have no losses, errors, that's gonna be correctable. And we also have this percolation argument that tells us that anything up to 0.248 uh, probability of lost qubits should also be correctable. Okay, and then um, we don't know just yet what happens in the middle, but that's what I'm going to tell you next. Okay, uh, so, so now we want to know what happens um, when, when we have both sorts of error. Um, uh, and the point is we can just use the same tricks that we used for the surface code. We can still use these parity checks to detect these computational errors. And it's the same idea, it's just everything has gone up in one dimension. So we, so we now join these parity check cubes together um, to avoid the lost faces due to the loss errors. So instead of using um, this kind of summation, let's say we lose this, this qubit here, which means that we can no longer infer the value of this cube, where we just measure this, this larger um, stabilizer operator. So now we have a minimum weight matching on this modified graph. Okay, uh, and we can simulate that in the same way as we did uh, in the two-dimensional case. So we just perform uh, Monte Carlo simulations uh, on the order of 100,000 simulations altogether, or 200,000 simulations altogether for a variety of different um, finite sized lattices. And we can use this to infer the value of the threshold for various different um, parameter values, okay? And the error model that we use is that we assume that everything is a bit noisy. So we assume that the computational errors uh, occur in the preparation of the step, um, in the preparation step, uh, the storage step. It turns out in this model you can get away with um, storing the cube, it's just for a single unit of time. Uh, uh, we also assume that there are errors uh, in the control Z gates, errors in the measurement, errors in the measurements, and we assume that all of this happens um, with the same rate, which we denote by P comp. Uh, and we furthermore assume that um, the loss errors all occur um, with some rate given by P loss, okay? And then uh, having done all of these uh, simulations, uh, we, can, we can infer um, that, the, that, the, that the correctable region of parameter space is actually this, this rather large region down here. Um, so we can go up to about 6%, uh, uh, oh, sorry, 0.6% probability uh, of computational errors um, due to all of these different error processes. Uh, and, ag and, and again, um, we can tolerate losses all the way up to 25%. We do something very similar here as we did in the previous case. Again, there are these um, finite size effects um, that are related to, um, the f in the percolation problem, you, you get these very large um, percolated regions that can, that can actually, for these simulations on these small lattices, they can take up the whole lattice. So what we find is that when we're very close to the percolation threshold, we get some funny um, effects where the essentially the scaling breaks down, okay? So we leave, leave out these points down here, which we're a bit dubious about from our, from our fit, and we just fit the quadratic to the values that we obtain up here. And yet again, um, we find that, um, that this quadratic curve to within, to within our um, confidence interval actually passes through uh, this axis at a roundabout where we expect it to from, these, uh, from this bond percolation argument. So that kind of convinces us that, 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 that this, these numerics are sound and also that this percolation argument is the is the right picture. Okay. 
So that's um, almost the end of my talk. Uh, so just to conclude, we've developed methods for overcoming loss errors um, both in the, in the surface code uh, and, in this, um, and in this fault tolerant quantum computing scheme. Um, and what we found is that um, uh, a, a, a small modification, it's really a modification of how we do the post-processing, um, the classical post-processing uh, in, in Rausendorf's scheme for fault tolerant measurement based quantum computing. We find that this is extremely robust to both computational errors and loss errors. And we find that there's this very large um, region of parameter space where we can correct uh, for, for both types of errors, okay? So I should just uh, finish up by just highlighting some, some um, other work that's going on. Um, so I'm not involved in all of this, um, but I think most of the people who are involved in this are, are here. So um, David Herrera-Marty, who is uh, a PhD student um, at, uh, also at Imperial College, um, uh, together with Austin, Fowler, um, <coughs> and various other people, uh, uh, they've um, actually studied an an, uh, a photonic implementation uh, of this scheme, um, and you can read about that here, or you can talk to David about it. Um, Simon Benjamin um, and his student Li Ying uh, in Singapore uh, have also looked at the case where, um, where the gates in your computer can fail with some probability, but it's, it's kind of heralded errors. And it turns out that um, the tricks that we use here can also be applied to that situation. So Simon's going to talk about that tomorrow. Um, and then there are a couple of posters uh, on related ideas um, uh, where you have non-deterministic gates or where you have kind of fixed defects in your, in your computer. And both of those posters uh, are upstairs. Okay. So um, that's the end of my talk. Thanks for your attention. We have time for a couple questions, but before that, there's an uh, which is there will be a group or conference photograph that's taken outside this uh, conference center and will happen immediately before lunch, so please don't disappear. Presume the food would keep you anyway. Yeah, thanks for a great talk. Just a question. So at the moment, you have lost just before measurement only, correct? Um, uh, yeah, okay, that's a really good point, uh, which I should have mentioned. Um, so, so this particular model, we have loss either at the preparation step or just before the measurement step. So, so, so actually what we neglect here for these thresholds is, let's say there were losses um, at intermediate through. times, yeah, yeah. right? So after, after you've started doing your C phase gates, we actually ne neglect that effect. Other um, questions? I, well, there's <laughs> another <laughs> caveat to that. So... Um, we haven't looked at what the threshold for that process, was, but it's quite clear that if you have if you have losses at intermediate times, the errors will be um, localized, and and so uh, you should actually get a very high threshold for those for that process as well. It won't be as high as as 25 percent, but it will be much higher than you would expect for the for the unlocated errors. Further questions? So I have one that's maybe very naive. Uh, when you do the C phase gate, you have multiple qubits that you have interacting, and you said that you accounted for errors in that preparation step. Uh, how does your model account for the fact that those errors are then correlated physically across multiple qubits and will spread if you have a sequential application of these C phase? So um, one thing is that they don't spread very far because the, the circuits for creating these cluster states are constant depth. So they won't spread very far, but, they, but, you, but you're right, you will get correlated errors. So those are accounted for in our noise model but we don't, we don't make t any special effort to, uh, to actually correct for those. And in fact, if, I think some simulations that Jim Harrington and also Austin Fowler have done show that if you account for that, you can push this threshold up um, ever so slightly, so you can push it up from, I mean, we, we get about 0.6 here, okay, or just, just over 0.6, but you can push that up towards 1% if you, if you um, make your uh, matching algorithm a bit more sophisticated to take account of those effects. Any further questions? Let's thank our speaker one more time.